Good morning. Good morning, Rock Church. Only one person said good morning. Good morning, Rock Church. Good morning, Rock Church. Welcome, everyone. Happy Fourth of July, Independence Day. It's our birthday as a nation. All right, if everybody wants to, to rise up with us, yes. we're going to turn our hearts and our affections to the Lord. We're going we're gonna to read the call to worship. It's coming out of Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Amen. Who's just thankful for another new day? Just breath in your lungs. We're going to sing this morning about the Lord bringing us out of the grave. We're going to start it again, though, <laughs> to make sure that we're on track. <laughs> I was buried beneath my shame. Sorry, guys. Bear with us. <laughs> Sorry about that. Of ways, it was my tomb till I met you. There we go. It's still true, y'all.
Man, I know that it is 4th of July. And we have an amazing country to celebrate, but man, I just, it pales in comparison to Jesus. Man, he says, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave, but I come from a different land, a different kingdom with a different king and a freedom that I've tasted that is free for everybody to taste is unlike the freedoms and the gifts that have been, been purchased for me here in America. It's, it is a freedom like I've never experienced or known or can put words to. I wish there was a better word other than freedom to describe it. Jesus, we just thank you this morning. We celebrate you this morning. We honor you this morning. We worship you this morning. The word says that in all that we do, man, we can celebrate America and light off fireworks and still do it to you and find glory in the beauty of everything around us. We worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Anybody want to cut the lights on? There we go. I mean, we could just stay there and I'll keep crying and doing all that good stuff. Good morning, guys. Everyone can greet each other. Yeah, say hello. Yes. This is America's a party this morning. It's America's birthday. Say hi to somebody. <sighs> Man, these guys, oh, are, these guys are stuck. We should have probably just kept them. Hey, and while we're kind of starting to find our seats and stuff like that, if you've got uh, K through fifth graders, they can go up to Kids Rock if you haven't already taken them up there. And we, it's, it's a holiday weekend, so we might have some new people in the house. So look, look out for guests. Say hi to them. If you guys want to kind of just start making your way to your seats. Was good. That was good. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Hey, uh, there's there's uh, somewhere next to you. There's blue communication cards. No pictures, please. No pictures. Uh, <laughs> there's communication cards on your on your seat. If you're new or if you've been coming a little bit and you've never kind of really connected with anybody or filled one out, go ahead and fill in some information and put it down. We don't. We just we just want to uh, have a way to contact you if, if need be. You can put a prayer request on there if you want. We got a team of people that pray over those, um, and you can get that to somebody who looks like they know what they're doing or drop it off back at the offering table. Um, and let's see, members, if you guys if if you guys are coming here. If you guys are not plugged in part of the, the Rock Church membership family, we would encourage you guys to. We got a, we got a, a class that, go, that you go through. It's called Growth Track. It's awesome. It's just kind of fellowshipping with everybody, getting to know that we're on mission together. Like our banners up here, know God, find family, live kingdom-centered lives, and be on mission together. It's, it's kind of the mission statement. It's what, it's what's in our hearts, what we're, what we're going after, and... and uh, the, the membership class kind of helps solidify all that. So if you haven't, 
Check it out. It's awesome. Woohoo! All right. We are so thankful for God's presence here this morning. And Yo, I hold just... up. This is, this is Ashley's first time up here. So it everybody sure just give is. her a hand. She, she, was, so, she was warming up and sounded better than me already. I was like, so man. So if I'm know. quiet, my husband says that I talk soft. So just go. <laughs> so it is, um, let's give it up for war for women. <laughs> July 18th at 5 p.m., Pastor Terry's house. And then we have next weekend, Men of Valor, July 11th at 5 p.m. at Pastor Josiah's. So if you don't know um, where that's at, just get with somebody and they will tell you. At Rock the Park. We've been talking about this every... What? Did you guys boo? Oh, you're fired. Um... We, we've postponed it. Uh, me and Josiah were talking this morning like, man, we, we are like cold weather guys. We don't like this humidity and heat. And so we postponed, uh, we, we pushed off Rock the Park to September 12th. We're hoping it'll be a little bit cooler, a little less humid. It is going to be at our new outreach center down on, on Cedar Street. We're ex super excited about it. I'm excited about it just to be out there and worshiping in the neighborhood and kind of connecting with that, that area in town. So you guys mark that in your calendars and show up. And don't come here because we won't have church here. So, Yeah. And then we have marriage retreat coming up. I'm excited about that. It's going to be our first time. We only have 15 slots left. So make sure you get in the back and sign up for that. You'll want to put your $100 deposit, $100 deposit down so that we can save your spot. It's going to be November 11th through the 13th. Thursday night through Saturday afternoon at Country Inn and Suites in Galena. So we are super excited about that. Mark your calendars, take off work, and get babysitters where they need to be get. So. Oh, and we have the youth camp sponsors. Um, we need some of those. Um, we're looking for 10 volunteers to give $100 towards the youth as sponsors for church camp. Yo, so, I'm putting a hundred oh, on it right now. Looks like Who, we got is there, one, is there anybody else who will throw a hand sponsor, up? Hundred bucks, just two, pledge it. Look three, it. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. JD's good for two or three. So, Ten, uh, eleven. All right, we've already. <laughs> We're on it. That's all. Look at how easy that was. Give it up for you, everybody. So now we have our youth being sponsored to go to camp this and, summer. And you know, at, at KC, uh, Brittany, she's not here, Brittany and David, they were talking about their two kids, and, and they had, like, watched a video about what these kids are doing. This is not in the notes. This is just a shameless, like, plug, just so you guys hear it. They watched this video about it, and their kids were so excited. He, he, Christian came around to me. He was like, Joe, Joe, you know about Camp Elevate? And I was like, no. And he's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm pretty excited to go. He's like, you, sh you should go, and you should be like, a, uh, you know, work with kids. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know what that is. But it was, and then Brittany <laughs> later said, well, this is the camp they're going to. And so I was like, man, Christian is, like, sincerely excited to go because of what he saw in there. So, you know, you're, you're, you're putting money towards something awesome. Yes. Um, so I just, I just wanted to throw that in there and, and encourage you guys with that. But in, in, the, in the vein of worshiping the Lord with our pocketbooks, we're going to move on to offering now. And uh, Jesus is trying to go on vacation too. So everybody, we need to, we need to collect an offering. But seriously, it's, I don't have anything hugely spiritual and amazing to say about, about giving um, with, our, with our finances other than the fact of like, it's just Holy Spirit is so clear in my heart. The things that I'm reluctant to do or the things that like bother, well, you know, if I, but what if, or in all the what if questions. And, and obviously with finances, that's, that's always, there's plenty of what ifs. And, and so for me, that's just, that's just perfect soil to dig into and say, all right, well, this is all the more reason to give. So we've got, we've made it super easy. There's plenty of ways to give. You can give with cash or check. Um, in the back there, who's doing, all, who's doing the square reader? Anna's doing the square reader. She's back there. So you can give her the square reader with a card back there. There's also a box that you can drop in, cash or check back there. Otherwise, we, can, we have the Rock Church app, which is probably the easiest way to give. Everybody who has that, raise your hand. If you don't have it, you should get it. Um, so now I'm just, I want to just pray over our, our offering this morning. And God, we just, we thank you that... Um, Everything that we have, 
even our, even our very bodies, the voice that I'm speaking with over this microphone, you've given. You've given. You, you allow us to have these things and give. So God, we just thank you that with cheerful hearts, we give back to you. We thank you with cheerful hearts that we give back to you. And we thank you that you bless it tenfold, thirtyfold, a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, um, to be able to sponsor the kids, um, you'll want to see Danielle. Danielle, raise your hand. She's in the She's back waving right now. Right there. So you'll see her to be able to do that. Thank you. Or you can just make out your cash and check donations to me. And I, there's I'm, also I'm a trustworthy. Place, there's a place on the app. You can also do it through the app. So. All right. And as a few people are finishing up back there. If everybody wants to stand up, we, we enjoy honoring the speaker, the pastor, the, the teacher who is bringing the word of the Lord. Josiah, on this, on this uh, holiday week, this guy's been held away digging through the word. So if everybody wants to give him a hand, he's going to share the gospel with us this morning. Am I good? There we are. Morning. Everyone having a good 4th of July weekend? Yes? I spent the night um, consoling my dog. Anyone else? I'm not kidding you. So my, my mom and my wife took the kids out to 4th of July fireworks and about 9 o'clock or whatever it was, they start booming all over the place and he is literally on top of me vibrating. And he's a big old golden retriever, so it's kind of funny. No one else's dogs experienced that? No? Just mine? Okay, good. So, let me say something about 4th of July real quick. Can I get scriptural with you? Bible. Jesus. Anyone into Jesus in here? Cool? Yeah? Listen. Unfortunately, the Bible and Jesus are political. Now, I'm not going to say they're like a two-party system or anything like that in the Bible, but I am super thankful, and we should be thankful for America, but I also want to make sure that we are called to do what as missionaries? We're called to go out and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? We want people from every country around the world to thrive, right? And I think there's something that's attacking the American church, and I won't get into this too deeply, but it's attacking the American church, and it's a religion of nationalism, a religion of being obsessed with politics and obsessed with, like, the health of America, now look, I'm for the health of America, but I'm for the health of every, Iran and Iraq, because guess what? Jesus loves every one of those people. Right. You guys hear that? Yeah. So, let's celebrate Fourth of July, but let's remember people all over the world are people that we're after and that Jesus loves. Cool? All right, that's all I have to say about Fourth of July. Now, today I get to preach another sermon on Jesus' secrets. And if you guys remember my opening sermon, we talked about Jesus in parables and the reason he started talking in parables. One of those reasons was is that he was talking to people kind of, he was kind of judging. And, and judging in a way, was like, it was like this. He would tell them a parable and certain people that had the heart, that had a soft heart and were receptive to his message would understand. He would, it, it would be judgment to those who heard it and wouldn't understand because they had a hardened heart and they had no interest in hearing what the parable had to say. Right? So if you think of salvation, I don't want you to think of it in terms of, okay, I raised my hand one Sunday and now I'm saved and I'm good. I'd rather you think of salvation as a spectrum. You are saved. There is regeneration of the heart, and you are entered into the kingdom at that moment. But salvation is a process, right? Even when you die, do you know when you get to heaven, you're still going to be learning more and more in, of the in, infinite creator? You're going to go deeper and deeper into the knowledge of who Jesus is for eternity. So we're going to, heaven's going to, we're going to see him face to face, but man, it's going to get better and better and better and better. That's how big he is. And when does, uh, when does eter eternity start for you? Right now. Right? It starts the day you accept Jesus Christ. So I'd rather you think of salvation as a spectrum. Yeah? So, everyone stand up with me. One last time. I want to read the scripture together. So the parable I'm going to be speaking about is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 45. 
The first one is called the parable of the hidden treasure, and it says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Second verse in the second parable is the parable of the pearl of great value. It says this, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of God. You guys can be seated. So my point of salvation being a spectrum is this. As you get sanctified, right? As you continue to get more sanctified and, and, and learn more about who Christ is, you learn more about the word of God. This becomes more illuminated to you. You start to understand it deeper. It's not that once you're saved, now I understand all of the Bible. That's not how that works. There's new revelation that comes time and time and time again. So when we read these parables, listen, I hope you get a nugget. I hope in your sanctification you're soft, your heart is soft enough to receive something and you learn something. But two years from now we could preach the same exact message from the same scriptures and it's going to be illuminated even bigger. You hear that? We still deal with hardened hearts that, need, that Jesus is working on. Right? So I want you to open up today. Let's see what we can get as a body. Right? Let's see what we can get today from these scriptures. So... In these two parables, he's talking about this. In the first one, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything, all that he has, and buys that field. So he finds something in a a treasure and sells everything. He's willing to lay down everything in his life and be all about that one thing. And then there's the pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold again all that he had and bought it. Now I first wanna paint this picture. Right now, do you see the kingdom of God of so much value that you're willing to sell everything you have to obtain it? And it's dead silent here. Right? Because guess what, we are not Jesus yet. We are getting there. And I'm not telling you tomorrow, don't get all motivated and go sell everything and do anything crazy. I'm not saying that yet. I'm saying we need to realize where we are in this moment, that this message is for all of us. Now, what is the kingdom? Romans 4, 17 says this, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I love the way Dallas Willard says it is this. The kingdom definition is the range of his effective will where what he wants done is done. Do you see that? You should just sit there and think about that. What is the kingdom? It is the range of his effective will where what he wants done is done. Think about that for a second. Every situation in your life, every relationship, moment to moment in your job, If you're searching after the kingdom, what you're really searching after is his will being done, right? Remember the Lord's prayer? Heaven to earth, your will be done on heaven, in heaven as it is on earth. You access this kingdom by getting his will done in every situation. Every marriage fight you have, you try to go seek after the kingdom. What is his will in that situation? You see that? So that's how I want us thinking about the kingdom. Now there's a story, and I'm going to start with. We're going to start with a problem. There's a story of a man named Roy Wettstein. He was a rock collector. This is actually a true story. You guys can look it up. It's pretty fascinating. So Roy was a uh, geologist, right? He's a rock guy. And he goes out, and one day they have this, I guess they have these things like rock shows. It's kind of like a gun show, but a rock show. And they'll get all these huge room of um, gems and rocks and everything else. And his sons, he actually didn't have any cash on him, so his sons both had $5 a piece. They're little kids. They're like, here, Dad, take our $10 and go find us some cool rocks. Now realize this is a guy that knew what he was looking for. So he goes to the show, and they've got tables full of all these shiny, super cool rocks. And this guy, being somebody that knows what he's looking for, goes to the spot where it's kind of all the ugly stuff, the spot where no one else is looking because he knows he has an eye for stuff that's of value. He goes over there, and in this Tupperware container he sees a sapphire and it's big and it's ugly and it's not very, it's not, it's not a good looking rock. And on, on there, there's, there's a price tag that says 15 bucks. And remember, he has $10 cash. 
So he asked him, he's like, hey, would you consider taking $10 for the sapphire? And the guy said, oh, that's fine, sure, whatever. Well, he leaves there, he's like a little kid that just won the lottery. When he had that appraised that year, it appraised at $2.5 million. $2.5 million, it was over 1,000 carats. Okay, so we're talking a monster, one of the biggest ever in the world. In a Tupperware for 10 bucks. Now, here's the problem. I'm kind of using this as a parallel to that, par that parable. How many of us go to those rock shows and we're over there searching through all the, the shiny stuff, trying to find something of value, when in reality we're blind to what has the most value, that has eternal value, that's actually worth something? Let's talk about some examples. Let's talk about some examples. So I'm going to start with myself. I like to make sure you guys know I am on the same playing field as you. I am not better than you because I'm a pastor. I am leading the way in being broken. That is what I consider my job. I am leading the way in saying I'm a broken sinner and I need Jesus Christ every single day and every moment of my life. Now, here's what I am. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, and I'm a gym owner. And I was kind of examining my life and I'm like, where am I trying to find these shiny rocks and ignoring what's actually of infinite value? So let's start with, I'm a husband. Do I have anyone too young? My daughter can hear this, I don't care, okay. So what do you think husbands want all the time way too much of? Sayla what? <laughs> she knows, we joke about this. I'm like, my wife, is my wife giving me enough sex? Is my wife giving me enough sex? Right, or is my wife serving me enough? Is she cool enough? Is she letting me do the things? Right, all these things that I think are of value in my marriage, are they really of value? Right? Am I thinking, remember that definition of, of, of the kingdom, the range of effective of will, where what he wants done is done? Am I after the kingdom in my marriage? Am I willing to lay down everything else in my life and go after the kingdom, or am I wanting the shiny rocks, the things that don't really have any value? I'm a father, right? Is my daughter awesome? Do people like her? Is she beautiful? Does she get good grades? Does she check all the boxes on what we think is awesome in America? Or, right, am I raising her up as a little kingdom warrior? Right, am I pouring Jesus into her? Am I modeling a Christian life for her? Am I showing her what a godly man is? Right, am I going after what's of infinite value? I'm a pastor. Is my church growing? Do other path pastors respect me? Does my congregation think I'm smart? Does my congregation think I'm worthy to even be up here at all? Right, those shiny gems or infinite value. You know what, am I preaching? Am I first of all trying to please God up here? Am I first of all, am I preaching the gospel message? Do you see this parallel? One's after the kingdom, one's after the things of the world. But guess what, sometimes these shiny rocks, they look like they're of the kingdom. They look like they're, you're searching after the kingdom, but you're not. We're, we're searching after those fake little gems that aren't worth anything. And the last one is I'm a gym owner. Am I getting rich? Is my gym blowing up? Does everyone in the community think I'm still successful as a businessman? Or am I pouring into people's lives? Are they seeing Jesus in me when I come to the gym? Am I adding value to their lives? Am I using it as a mission field? You see that? That is eternally valuable. Everything else dies with me. Now, let's talk about all of us. Because now you've seen that I have these problems, now I'm going to prove that you guys have this problem. 17% of Americans say they tithe. Because remember, these scriptures, it says they sold all that they have. It's funny that Jesus talks about money more than anything else, because guess what money has? Money has our heart. A lot of the time, money controls our heart. 17% of Americans say they tithe. With tithe, if you don't know, is 10% of your income given to God. That's a scriptural thing. Now, when Barna ran the actual statistic, this is funny, 17% say they tithe, 3% actually tithe. 3%. So do I think the American church understands and has counted the cost of what it means to actually seek the kingdom, to sell all they have and find the kingdom? 
No, I think I have proof in the statistics that we don't. Now here's the other one. 11% of Christians have read the Bible. All of the Bible. 11% in their lifetime have read all of the Bible. The word of God, the words of Christ, Jesus himself, the living word, 11% of us have read it. Listen, I know that I'm being hard. And I'm going to get to the good news here shortly. But I have to paint this picture for you. 15%, 15% of us, we've read half of it. It's pretty good. You guys are really stone-faced. Are you guys? (laughs) I'm sorry this is bad news, but this is just where we are. Have we counted the cost and laid everything to go after the kingdom and what's of eternal value? So think of it in terms of our church, personally. I'm going to get a little bit hard here. How many of us lay down things and prioritize our plans around things like kingdom community? How many are willing to say to the things of the world, no? You know what? That has some value, but yet this has eternal value. I'm going to lay down my desires in my life. I'm going to sell everything I have, and I'm going to go after the treasure that's actually valuable. How many make Sunday morning a priority? And listen, there are some in here that do. Hear me. How many of us actually take the time and talk to God on a daily basis? On a moment-to-moment basis? How many pray without ceasing in our deep relationship with Him? Because we know the value of the kingdom. So, I think I've painted a picture, and I think you guys know that. We don't, unfortunately, and we have not counted the cost, and we have not realized the value of the kingdom. None of us. And that's somewhat exciting to me. I don't know if it's exciting to you guys, but I like to know the fact that I have not arrived in my relationship with Jesus, that there's more, that there's always going to be more that I'm gonna fall deeper and deeper in love with him and start to realize who he is and I'm gonna find joy that I've never experienced before. Does that make anyone else excited? So Psalms 49, six through eight proves this to us that this is who we are. It says this, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice. The truth is, all of us boast and trust in our riches, our comforts, our vanities. Yet what are they actually worth eternally? This scripture is basically saying this, all of us have boasted in the wrong things and fall short, and our lives required a ransom, required a redeemer, required somebody to pay the price because we've been that bad. And that person was Jesus Christ. This scripture says that all men Right? Find too much comfort, too much in vanity, too much in riches. But yet we have somebody that paid the price for us in Jesus. So we're going to get to the solution here shortly. You guys want the good news yet? You're like sick and tired of hearing the bad news. So let's make sure we all understand. All of us, every person in this room, find too much value in comforts. In America, I think that would be especially true. Would you guys agree? We love our houses. We love our cars. We love more comfort, more comfort, more comfort. And we feel like we are excess and of value if we have more of it. The scripture teaches the opposite. The only thing that's really worth any value at all is the kingdom. Okay? So I'm going to give you five truths about the kingdom in this passage. I'm going to read the passage one more time. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered it up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The next one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, five truths that we learn from this passage about the kingdom. I want you guys to write these down and I want you to remember them. The first one is this. The kingdom is priceless in value. Priceless. You cannot put a price tag or any kind of value system in your head on the value of the kingdom. It is worth infinitely more than we could ever imagine. The second one's this. The kingdom, and we see this in these scriptures, are personal. Personal. You and God and your relationship is gonna look different than the person next to you. You hear that? 
you can't try to look at this person over here, and of course we can model after Christians and stuff, but you can't try to look and see that it's gonna look exactly like this person. It's a very personal thing. The third thing, the kingdom is the true source of real joy. Did you hear that? The kingdom is the real source or the true source of real joy. Guys, all of us are after happiness. Everybody's after happiness and joy. And yet we go after things, we go after these shiny rocks that are fleeting. Ooh, I got a really, really shiny one, it's awesome for a day, and then guess what? Uh, The true source of eternal happiness, guys, is the kingdom of God. The fourth thing, not everyone, this is important, not everyone comes by the same approach. Did you hear that? Not everyone comes to finding the kingdom by the same approach. All of us in here have different stories about how they came to Jesus, yes? All of us in here have different stories about how our relationships have deepened with Christ. It doesn't look the same person to person. Listen, Christ is calling every one of us in our own ways. There are certain things that are going to touch your heart and not mine, and certain things that are going to touch my heart and not yours. It's our, it's our job to give in to his will, right? To answer that calling when he's whispering in our ear, right? And find the kingdom. And the fifth one, and this is where we're going to go next, and this is about the solution. It has a high cost. Did you hear that? It has a high cost. So now that we know we fall short in this area, the, here, we want to get into the solution. What do we do? What do we do about the fact that we do not give up everything in our lives and search the kingdom? That we won't sell all of our things to buy the field, that we won't sell all of our things to buy the one pearl, that we won't give everything up in our desires to get after the kingdom. What do we do? I'm going to say this. We count the cost. A lot of us have not done that in our Christian walk. So I'm going to go to Luke 14, 25 through 33. Turn there with me. And I'm going to read it. Now great crowd accompanied him, and he, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Ouch. Why did Jesus use such strong language? Do you think he literally meant to hate your, mo- your wife, your mother, and all that? Do you think that's what he meant? But it, it's kind of like this. He kind of did mean it. He didn't mean it. Here's what he is saying. There's nothing as important. Nothing. No relationship. No job. No activity. No career. Nothing is as important as following him. And this is why he uses such strong language. And I can tell you as a pastor, it's super hard when you're discipling people and mentoring people and you're you're helping with conflict and people haven't understood that to be a Christian is to make Jesus Lord. When you make Jesus Lord, everything else I don't care about. Your career, your desires, all that stuff, that's all all great. What the only thing that really matters is that Jesus is Lord. So... He goes on, so he goes on. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He says, bear my own cross. Bear my own cross, this is what that means. All of us guys have desires that are ungodly. We have wants that are ungodly. We have things in our lives that we think we need that we don't need. Bearing my cross means that, guess what? I'm putting that on the back burner. I'm dying to that. And I'm following Jesus because I trust and love him and know that he knows better than I do. That's what bearing your cross looks like. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
any of you that does not denounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Ouch. Can I tell you that you are not strong enough in yourself to ever do that? Can I tell you that Jesus sets up an impossible standard on purpose because he shows what it means to actually live a godly life? Does he know, do you know that he knew you were gonna fail at this? Do you know that's why he went to the cross because he knew you were gonna fail at this? That doesn't mean though that we don't try and that doesn't mean that we don't live by this truth. Are you willing to denounce everything that you have to be his disciple because you believe this is the source of real joy? And listen, I don't know what those things are that you need to denounce. I have to, they're different for every person in this room. But have you sat down and have you counted the cost and said, hey, you know what, am I actually a Christian? Am I actually a disciple or I just go to church because it makes me feel good? Do I truly seek after the kingdom like I say I do? Have I understood what that costs me and that it costs you everything? It costs you your wants, your desires. It costs you going out on Friday nights like you used to and drinking. It costs you sleeping around like you used to. It costs laying down my career choices possibly if it means to prioritize being in relationship with him. Have you counted those costs? What is the cost? The cost is this. The cost is a sin. Sin causes separation from God. It causes pain. It causes sorrow. It causes hurt. Guys, that's what he wants to rescue you from. So to finish, I'm going to read a quote. It's from C.S. Lewis. It says this. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Did you hear that? Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Man, that's good. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And this is my favorite part. And with him, everything else will be thrown in. Guys, we seek after Christ. Guess what? All these things that I'm talking about, careers and relationships and all the things that we love in this world are not in of, end of themselves bad things. It's that you realize when you find the kingdom and you search after that, guess what? That gets thrown in in a way better way because those things are not God now. Those things are not idols now. Those things are not the source of our real joy. Jesus is the source of our real joy and he loves to bless you with those things. You see the difference? You guys can stand up with me together. Band, you guys can come. So guys, if you take anything from this sermon, I just want you to think about, I want you to sit down and I want you to count the cost. What are you costing yourself and your soul if, with the things that you're prioritizing? Is it causing you pain? Are you missing out on joy? Are you missing out on a deeper relationship with Christ that you've never experienced before? Do you know the level of happiness you could get to if you actually chased after the kingdom? If you sold everything? gave up all your desires, died to yourself in every way and said, you know what? No, I'm going after the kingdom above all else. Then what does your life look like? You guys will bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that you knew we weren't gonna be able to live up to this standard. You knew we weren't gonna hate our mom and hate our dad and hate our kids and lay our jobs and you knew we weren't going to do it so you went to the cross and died for us, God. And now you live inside of us and you've given the power to walk out this life in a way that we never knew possible, Lord. Help us to submit to you. Help us to learn to sell more and more and more to chase after and buy that treasure in that field, buy that pearl. Go after the kingdom, go after the things that are of eternal value. We thank you and we love you for dying for us, God. All God's people said.
So, ushers, if you guys want to get ready, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you would like to take partake in communion with us, the ushers are going to direct you to grab the uh, body and the blood. for that anointed word Um, and we come with reverence um, to God and we're going to do confession now if everybody wants to read along with us merciful God you made us in your image with a mind to know you a heart to love you and a will to serve you but our knowledge is imperfect our love is not always constant Our obedience is incomplete. We acknowledge our failure to fully glorify you the way you designed. Help us daily to grow into your likeness. In your tender love, forgive us and draw us more fully into the true identity we have as your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And now I am going to read an assurance over you all. By grace, you have been saved through, um, sorry, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Let all who have repented and been saved through the faith in Christ rejoice. He has given you grace. He has given you faith. And he has given you the ability to live in the new identity he alone has given you. Amen. Guys, I always think about, we, we always read this passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I, every single time I think about, Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered from you. 
And every single time I think about it, Paul was not sitting at that table. He wasn't there. Yet he stands and he, and, he, and he says, what I have received from the Lord, I deliver to you. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to make the separation and say, well, that was Paul and Paul received this great revelation or that was the disciples because they were there. Well, Paul's, Paul wasn't there. And we didn't get the luxury of sitting down at that table, but that is literally what this moment is. Faith is not a, it's not a point in time. It is not a point in time. So we approach this and we read this scripture. It's like you're sitting down at the dining table with your Lord. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may partake of the body. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, this little plastic cup that I can never get the lid off of is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. You, you can receive his blood. When I woke up this morning, before I rolled over, before I did anything, Psalm 103, verse 5, just rolled through my head. And it says, he, he satisfies my mouth. It actually says your, but I, I personalize it, and I don't say it in my head as your. I, he satisfies my mouth with good things. So that he will re renew my youth like the eagles. And you think about what we just did, Lord. We just partook in your body and in your blood. And your body was broken and bruised for our iniquities. And here we are, Lord, that you've given yourself that we would satisfy our very mouths like you said in the garden lest we would stretch out our hand and take and eat from the tree of life and live forever. You are satisfying our mouths through the broken, bruised, bloodied body of your sacrifice so that we can be whole to restore our youths. And Jesus, I thank you that, that it isn't routine, that it I'm confessing, we're confessing that with our mouths that you are literally restoring our youth. You paid the price in your body so that we could be free, so that we could be strong, so that we could be healed, so that we could be whole. And I just thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship with us.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning. That line in that song that says, you're everything you've promised. God, the reality is, is I think sometimes people don't always feel like the Christian walk is everything. Sometimes it's frustrating, sometimes it's confusing. But Lord, the reality is, is that your faithfulness is true. God, that you would just encourage us by this word that we heard today, Lord, that this upside down kingdom that you have called us to live in is a real freedom, is the true freedom, Lord. God, that you would just encourage our spirits by that, that you would give us patience as we're walking out this life. We thank you for hope. We thank you for truth, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, Rock Church. You are dismissed.